So we'll just go ahead. Um, we've got lots to cover again today. We're delighted to have Julia Behrens with us this evening. This is the fifth in our series of um, Lyme Awareness Month webinars. I know that uh, the month May has just finished, but this absolutely fits into it. Julia Behrens has practiced as a medical herbalist for over 20 years and has gained a specialist and in-depth understanding of the complexities of Lyme disease and its co-infections. This has developed from her multi-systemic approach to medicine and considerable research, which she still continues. Over the last 10 years, she's attended numerous conferences across Europe concerned with Lyme disease, worked in a Lyme clinic, and collaborated with other Lyme professionals across a range of disciplines. She's just brought out a book called Lost in Lyme, and so this webinar, which is called The Therapeutic Use of Medicinal Plants in Supporting People with Lyme Disease, will be centered around that book. And we've got some wonderful slides of hers, which um, we'll now share. So uh, just to mention that uh, you're very, very welcome to put any questions you have or comments in the Q&A or the chat section of Zoom. And she'll be presenting for about 30 minutes, and then we'll go over to questions. So, Julia, is everything okay at your end? Yes. Wonderful. Good. Thank you. So we'll just um, share the screen and um, enlarge it. Sorry, this is um, because of our technical issues. Sorry, we're doing it a different way. So you just say next um, as we proceed. Julia, and over to you. Thank you very, very much again for being with us. Hello. Uh, well, my name is Julia Browns. I'm a medical herbalist and I've been practicing for 20 years and I specialise in Lyme disease. And yes, as Julian said, and thank you for having me here today, um, I've written a book. I didn't think I was going to write a book, but I wrote a book, Lost in Lyme, partly to try and help people navigate this Lyme journey that um, many people are on. And often people come to me and they feel a bit lost and um, they wonder which direction to take, whether to take antibiotics, how to get a test. Um, and I have found myself sort of guiding them through sort of married of symptoms, trying to um, unravel what was going on for them. And um, I often use Stefan Booner's um, research and other practitioners, and I've traveled for the last 15 years to Germany and various conferences to, you know, sort of gather my knowledge over the years. And But I do rely heavily on, on a lot of Stefan Booner's work and, and in my practice. And he's, he very much inspired me on this journey. So, um, but a lot of his work can be quite complicated or, or interesting for practice you know inspiring to, to practitioners and doctors but my clients found sometimes with brain fog it felt a bit complicated so I tried to simplify a few things and came up with some sort of helpful advice and some recipes um, and this book has been written with um, Daphne Lambert who uh, we worked together on this and ran Lyme clinics and um, retreats for people to support them through their diet and nutrition and sort of understanding their journey. Next slide please. So often people come to me um, when medicine lets them down, when they've tried the antibiotics and it hasn't worked, or they, they get ping pong ground a medical um, establishment and see more than, you know, seven, eight doctors before they come to see me and, and nothing has helped, or um, they don't want to go down the antibiotic route and want, want to try herbal medicine. So this is when I get to see people often. And um, it can be quite an amazing transformation for people sort of finding out what direction and where they're going on their journey and and sort of an exploration of who they are um a tremendous rebirth can happen on, on the other side of treatment and these are some quotes that clients have said we find parts of ourselves that we did not know we had we became we became a different person um, one client said, I'd like to have more energy and less pain, but I can't say I wish I'd never had Lyme. So these are the, these are the kind of sort of self discoveries that people find on this this journey. And when you hear about people suffering from Lyme, you hear about a lot of the pain and suffering, but actually 
the journey when you when you support someone through a journey or um a journey through Lyme disease it can be quite an, an awakening it's quite amazing what can happen next slide please so I'm a medical practitioner, so I look at the whole um, person and look at the whole approach and, and look at really what's going on. What, what are the symptoms? Um, are, are, are symptoms mimicking other conditions? And we're treating the individual. No, no protocol is the same. Everybody has different needs. Some people have had a history of taking antibiotics. Some haven't. Some have great gut health. Some haven't. Um, some are sensitive to certain things. Some aren't. So it's it. Um, each person has a very unique um, blend of herbs that is prescribed monthly for them, and it will change accordingly depending on how their systems change. But my main uh, objective is really when supporting someone with with people with Lyme, and it's usually a two hour consultation, is to help the eliminate the pathogens and look at what the possible co-infections are and marry up herbs that have four, five, six different actions that can cover a broad range of those conditions. Reduce some of the side effects from the antibiotics. This is really important, especially when people have um, feeling really nauseous and um, and um, have stomach aches, headaches from the detox or the herxing that could be happening with the antibiotics. Um, it's important to use herbs to help bind the toxins, but also ensure that there are herbs that can help um, get the antibiotics quicker into the cell and be more effective. I also try and reduce pathogens. As I said, co-infections are quite important. I uh, often see viral um, crossovers that can affect the immune system. Uh, the immune system. I look at vital steps to support the body's vital source. And I talk about that a little bit later, which are these, uh, it's an acronym for sort of looking at the social, the time it takes, the emotional, the physical and self, and how um, your environment has an impact on how you're healing and how you need, you know, what areas of your life needs work or attention to help you feel better. It's not just, you know, um, using antimicrobials to kill the bacteria. It's kind of looking at other things that are causing you pain. Um, and I suppose I'm, I mentioned this is that we need doctors and medical scientists from different sides of the uh, debate to work together. Um, as um, Gillian said, I worked um, in a GP surgery, working alongside GPs, you know, sort of communicating, finding out what the you know individual's needs are, doing physical examinations, Often people don't have time in a 15 minute consultation, so it's important to keep the doctors up to date and communicate with the patient so that they can ask for the relevant tests and work alongside them to support them. Um, for the benefit of the patient, they know when they feel better. The idea is that you know, most clients know when they're feeling better that, you know, if you know, people often ask me, well, do the her does the herbal protocol work? And I say, well, yeah, I wouldn't be doing this if, if I, it didn't work. And it's the clients know they feel better and they often fill in a tick form where they can really monitor how things are improving, which kind of inspired me to write the Lost in Line book. And I really wanted to um, let people's voices be heard because a lot of people who have got Lyme disease have been gaslit. They have been told it's all in their head and um, they're making it up. There's no way this can be happening. And um, as time goes on, you know, people are getting the tests that they need and the results to find out what's really going on and the help and support they need. So when you're being told it's all in your head that you haven't got um Lyme disease because you can't remember a tick bite it, it kind of perpetuates this cycle of of um ill health really and um I I look at that with my client next slide please so the concern is and and partly why this book is important because it's empowering people to take their health into their own hands kind of understands the symptoms of Lyme disease understand the testing that's relevant the antibiotics they may 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 be looking at that are relevant that could be supportive at an early stage or and I I go through a whole list of herbs that um about 28 herbs um and how they can be used to support individuals and also sort of have some mind maps to create really simple um easy reference guides to help people understand what the plants might be used for 
I mean, there are statistics to say that by two uh, by 2050, you know, 55.7 million people, 12% of the population in the USA could have Lyme disease, 17% in Europe. You know, that is massive. And that's a big concern to people, especially with, you know, global warming and um, creating an environment that um, ticks could thrive in. Um, and it's also, I don't think people recognise it's also estimated 500,000 people also are diagnosed with Lyme disease, which is more than cases of breast cancer and HIV combined. So this is a kind of illness that's kind of people don't talk about or get tested for, yet suffer in silence. Next slide, please. So this is one of the charts I have in my book here. Um, and you can see the sort of multi-systemic uh, approach that a practitioner would have to take looking at all of these things. Um, you know, some of the symptoms, disturb sleep, disorientation, vertigo, floaters, blurred vision, tinnitus, shortness of breath, cough, neck pain, awareness of heart, sore ribs, stomach upset, tremors. And a lot of the a lot of the Lyme symptoms can be so excruciating. Um, and some can be really mild. So the stiffness in the neck and the shoulders or the nausea, um, you know, you have to kind of sort of tweeze out what those whether those symptoms are part of their Lyme picture. If they've got a test, it's likely to be part of that. But you've also got to rule out some of the mimicking um, conditions like menopause or histamine intolerance, mast cell activation, that kind of thing, or Ellis Danlos. See a lot of people with Ellis Danlos um, can also um, cause some of these problems. Um, so this, you know, so it's back to this idea that all these symptoms can, some of these symptoms can be quite mild, but some of them can be really exaggerated and, and really painful and go on for a long time. So that, so that the individual actually starts thinking that's who they are, that's, that's they've had this for so long, they can't remember um, ever being well again. And they, they lose this real sense of um, being safety around their own health and being able to trust their health. And there's a real frustration with the individual. So looking at some of the herbs, these are, I'm, I'm going to talk through a few herbs that I use um, in the clinic that are anti, um, um, that um, can kill Borrelia burgdorferi and some of the co-infections, um, things like black walnut, cat's claw, Chinese skull cap, Japanese knotweed. Um, there are all things that, they're all herbs that I recommend to my clients to take to help um, get over the lines, but they're also many more herbs that are part of the protocol depending on what those symptoms are and what those the people's side effects are next slide please so i'm seeing a number of clients at the moment who are taking antibiotics and they are feeling really quite ill on them and in one sense you could see that as a, a herx reaction um, where the bacteria is dying off and you could support the individual, um, you know, with binders or herbs that can help eliminate toxins, make sure the liver pathways are functioning properly, um, but also sort of gentle herbs, introducing cups of tea to empower the individual that are anti-inflammatory, some things like chamomile or cramp bark, which is a muscle relaxant, feverfew. Um, the gu teng is another great one. Um, lavender and rosemary you know thinking about all the different ways whether you're putting lavender on the pillow or drinking an infusion of rosemary tree all of these things can be helpful and not contraindicated when you're on antibiotics and whether you're massaging them into your um, temples or as I said putting them on a the pillow they're just different ways that you can use the herbs because I often see people with huge bags carrier bags of of, of plants and supplements and um, not exact plants coming out of the bag, but um, yeah, huge supplements and, and people want to take them in lots of different ways. I've had some clients who come to see me who don't do not want to take capsules. So I have to get sachets made up for them and get amazing results with the combination of sachets of um, dried frozen um, herbs. But these are the kind of side effects. Diarrhea is another one and often recommend using astringent herbs with high in tannins to help sort of um, bind the stools. And again, charcoal, meadowsweet, again, and particularly the meadowsweet, very calming on the digestive system. 
people can feel Swedish. Uh, so people can feel sick. Sorry, um, when um, I'm very nauseous when um, when they suffer from um, some of the digestive upsets from antibiotics. So I often recommend Swedish bitters just to stimulate the digestive juices and to help um, the gut flora and the digestive tract. Mint, mint tea again, very calming. Um, loss of appetite, things like cinnamon, fennel, um, artemisia is another great um, herb just to put a couple of drops on their tongue just to help stimulate the digestive juices and get things moving and um, an antispirochete as well. Sensitive skin, people who are taking antibiotics often burn easily, so looking at ways to protect them in this, in, um, from the sun um, can also be helpful. Next slide, please. So these are this one is one of the herbs that I use a lot when people live in a um area that they are concerned about or high tick area. Um, because if you get if you get bitten by a tick and and one of the orthodox or um solutions is using antibiotics, you know, if we are going to be seeing a lot more ticks and coming into uh, contact with um climate change and the consequences of that. You know, the fear is that it'll be, you know, antibiotics for breakfast kind of thing as a preventative. And, you know, we can't go down that route at all. So using herbs like astragalus are in a high risk area as a preventative measure would be really, really helpful. Um, the astragalus can like, um, um, can turn off part of the immune system that the, that the tick saliva produces that turns off our immune system. So it can help um, turn that off so that our immune system stay strong and can help prevent infection. And um, Stefan Boone uses this a lot um, in, when people are in high risk areas, but, um, and there is controversial whether if you have got chronic Lyme disease, whether you should take it or not, because it can make the symptoms worse. Um, but everyone is, is, is unique. And, um, you know, sometimes the symptoms worse could be part of a die off, but it's supporting the individual's immune system um, to make them um, to help enable them to feel stronger. Next slide, please. So this is one of the charts that's in the book, and this is kind of helping people just see the types of, you know, if you're you're injured or bitten by a tick, just looking at the, the kind of pathways of inflammation and how the herbs can sneak in at different ways to reduce the inflammation, whether you've got, um, you know, the turmeric and um, the St. John's wort um, helping support reduce inflammations, um, you know, reducing the COX-1 uh, pathways. And it's a, just a map to help people understand how the plants are doing it. That's why we use three or four different plants to reduce the pathway, the inflammatory pathways. But you've also got to ask yourself when thinking about using anti-inflammatory herbs, you know, what type of pain is it? Where is the pain really coming from? And and that's often, un, you know, you know, why can chocolate help support some people with pain or a kiss from your mother or pink milk and it's really trying to tap into where that pain is and it can often be emotional and manifest as as physical um and it can often be the bacteria so it's kind of really sort of unpicking there's different levels of pain and what's happening there next slide please so um there are lots of ways that the herbs can be help support the individual, the antibacterial ways, you know, whether it's eating garlic, um, antimicrobial um, for the microbial effect or eating some of the, you know, the range of mint family that produce a lot of essential oils and they have antimicrobial properties. Some of the plants um, can inhibit the bacteri bacterial walls um, synthesis, making the cell wall porous, allowing the antibiotic in. Uh, Artemisia is quite renowned for this, and it leads to cell death and the bacteria can die due to the instability, so creating a hole within it. Um, other, other plants may inhibit the protein synthesis of the, of the bacteria, 
things like gentian, chelidonium or astragalus. The thing with uh, plants like chelidonium, it's best to use fresh. So in the first six months is, is when it's more uh, effective and then the activity dies off. Gentian's another great herb, but it's also you're, you're not just looking at these plants as as kind of plants that happen to inhibit protein synthesis. You're also looking at where the plants are coming from, how they're harvested, how they're, they're grown, what, you know, what, what method of um, subtraction, are they endangered? Is there a sustainable source? So there's, when thinking about antibacterial activity, you're thinking as a herbalist about all of those things and how that individual plant may be unique and support that individual more than another. Some plants help alter the cell membranes and contain lots of saponins causing leakage, um, things like licorice, horse chestnut, garlic, um, depending on what action you want. And with, when we know that Artemisia has antispirochete activity, we might use that more than another plant. Um, but we also might limit the use of it um, depending on you know, how often we want to use it and pulse that herb uh, once a month rather than use it more regularly, like, for example, garlic that you might have in your food um, on a more regular basis. Um, Artemisia was an interesting one um, that I discovered that the um, cell membrane, the function, um, even though it's effective in altering the cell, cell membrane, the saponines that cause the leakage, um, if the leaves are harvested um, in August, it's about 4%, and that saponin content drops to 0.06% if harvested in November. So depending on the where it's harvested, how it's harvested, will really depend on what active ingredients. And I think this is what I'm seeing again and again, is when people come to me with these bags of herbs, and they're saying, this isn't effective, this isn't working. And... And I go, well, I, I don't really know what, you're give, what you've been given or what you've got off the internet, but I surely don't know what quality it is. And, um, and I think that's the big question with herbal medicine is, is it's quality control and also sustainable harvesting techniques and making sure that there's a high turnover of the plants that you're using. And I know that a lot of the plants I use, I've used a high turnover um, of individual plants where I know some plants just you know capsules can just sit on the on the shelf for ages and and lose their active constituents so that is a real concern when thinking about herbs being active antimicrobial herbs it really it it might be it they might be effective but it also depends on what the quality is um, other herbs um, inhibit the nuclei acid um, nucleic acid synthesis and bind with the DNA and RNA and uh, we often see that with um, back, um, the berberine type families or, or herbs that contain berberines like um, Mahonia, Hydrastis, and again, Chelidonia. But again, berberine has to be used in quite high doses, high strength alcohol. And um, it's whether the digestive system of the individual can actually handle that. But it's often the combination and the synergy of how the plants work can make them more effective. So, so um, things like licorice and berberine can be um, you know, work really well together and supporting the gut health and having that antimicrobial effect. Next slide, please. So some herbs, as I said, is, is kind of trying to include some of these and um, herbs and plants in your diet because, and sort of connecting with the plant. Um, and that's why I'm so grateful to for Daphne to write the ch chapter on the book to give clients really useful recipes uh, and ways of making food taste good that can actually have a medicinal and beneficial approach, um, including great uh, garlic or grapeseed extract, ginger um, in, you know, in recipes. Not only do they um, break biofilms, but they also um, can make food taste really good. So it's kind of including it rather than just seeing it as a capsule or, or a, a, um, a cup of tea. Other herbs that increase or support the antibiotic type effect would be herbs like echinacea or elderberry. Um, and those herbs are particularly, the elderberry, for example, and the, and the cat's claw are particularly useful because you know, the, the cat's claw supporting the immune system and the CD57, but the elderberry also, you know, having that antiviral property. And we see that again and again 
um, it, it, it's not always the Borrelia burgdorferi that's the problem. It's the viral um, co-infection that can cause a, cause many of the problems. So it's the elderberries, herbs like elderberry or melissa, um, hutunia to have, you know, to add to your tinctures to have that kind of immune boosting effect that can be really helpful. Um, some of the antibiotics work by uh, this eflex pump. It's kind of like the um, the the bacteria has a way of just you know regurgitating the drug back out of its um, of its cell. And um, herbs like the berberine, the rosemary, and scutellaria particularly are helpful in stopping that efflux pump working and uh, allowing the antibiotic into the cell. So um, it's you know fascinating on how a lot of these herbs work. And when clients start understanding how they work, they they appreciate take it, tasting them or taking them, even if they taste a bit bitter and horrid. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I was wondering if anyone knew what this was in the chat. I don't know if we can come up with any ideas. Any Jim, no, no ideas have come through yet that I can see. No ideas. Well, this Put is... The game away. No, no ideas. Well, this is Japanese knotweed and it's been prepared for you like an asparagus. And um, it just goes to show that, um, you know, Japanese knotweed is one of my top herbs in supporting people with Lyme disease because it crosses the, the blood, um, blood brain barrier and its antimicrobial effect is um, can be prepared in lots of different ways. And this is one way of preparing it. Next slide, please. Yeah, just to say, Barbara, I'm sorry I didn't see your comment until too late, but Barbara had it right. Julie. Well done, Barbara. <laughs> it does look a bit like asparagus, though. So, you know, Japanese knotweed um, was introduced in the 1800s as an ornamental plant. And I find it fascinating that um, it's one of the top lime herbs and as I was a student I'd never heard of this plant or I'd never known of its medicinal values and I find it fascinating that this very very invasive plant um, and if you have it in your garden you'll be fined for it um, is you know coming out of the crack and the and cracks of the ground and um, and I've just shown you a little map of how invasive it is um, can be so useful to uh, people with Lyme disease. Next slide, please. So Japanese knotweed is one of my top herbs and I have it in capsules and I usually have a five in one strength because you can start taking capsules between five, 10 and 15 a day. So it's quite a high strength for it to be effective, but some people are happy with 10 capsules. So I, I have a, um, a five in one strength made up to reduce the number of capsules because I think it would really affect the gag reflex. Um, and you know, just looking at the many uses, analgesic, anti-cancer, anti-fungal, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, anti-spiroketal, anti-tusive, um, especially that shortness of breath, um, tickly cough, antiviral, astringent, capil capillary stimulant, cytokine modulator, diuretic, expectorant, immune stimulant, immune modulator, laxative, neurogenitive, phytoestrogenic, protects the liver and central nervous system. I mean, most plants don't have all those actions. So it's a really, really useful plant. It has a broad, spray, um, broad spectrum of antibacterial um, activities against spirochetes. And um, again, as I said, one of the main reasons I use it is because it crosses the blood bone barrier. Um, and people, when they start taking that, feel better within a few weeks. Um, it's also antiviral, and I remember clients saying that with they, when they had um, herpes simplex outbreaks, they used to get lots of regular, regular herpes. After five weeks, they had no more outbreaks. Um, so amazing results from this plant. Um, it also produces natural killer cells and protects the liver and brain from inflammation. And I think that's one of the big concerns. Next slide, please. Is that... Um, when the brain fog with Lyme disease um, can be so detrimental, uh, people find it difficult to read a book. 
um, they find it difficult to concentrate um, because of all the neurotoxins um, and herbs to support them like rosemary and ginkgo is increasing the circulation to the brain but the Japanese knotweed in particular um, is really really helpful and you know it's not just the Lyme community that are realizing this it's the um, the you know people with Alzheimer's are also realizing the benefits of resveratrol um, against neurogenitive um, disorders and looking at how it inhibits the um, the breakdown of acetylcholine and, and supporting brain health. Um, another great use of uh, cardio is for cardiovascular problems. And I used to see a lot of people with thing, uh, symptoms of shortness of breath, palpitation, light headedness, um, fluctuating blood pressure, and uh, resveratrol again acts as a vasodilator, lowers the blood pressure, inhib inhibiting um, uh, platelet aggregation, which I think can be a, a, a concern uh, for people. Um, find it really useful it's it's kind of funny that it kind of mimics the uh, effects of a calorie restricted two and five diet um so going to support people who are slightly overweight and help regulate their sugar levels um but it's also helpful uh, with protecting the telomeres um and dna damage um which occurs when aging so really it's one of those rejuvenating you know herbs but you know resveratrol is is high in Japanese knotweed and yet it's a plant that is illegal to harvest or grow uh, you can't move it from the site you'll get a two grand fine if you don't deal with it 50 grand fine if you really don't deal, deal with it and the problem with harvesting it from the wild is that you don't know whether people have put loads of pesticides to kill it and get rid of it because they won't sell their house if they don't um so it's it's quite difficult to harvest unless you've got it in your garden and you know what's happening with it, um, but you are not allowed to move it. Um, the other great thing about Japanese knotweed, other than the crossing the blood brain barrier, um, it's also got antiviral properties, again, for the herpes, as I mentioned before, um, and breaks down the biofilm, uh, and it can break down the biofilm on dental cavities. I see a lot, a lot of cli Lyme clients who... Um, are doing really really well and then they kind of plateau and often have to have a lot of dental work and some people are so fearful of going back into the medical um, establishment to get support because they've not been believed um, that they they are fearful of going to their dentist but often have to have the dental work or, or mercury uh, fillings removed um, before things improve again so and that can take another one or you know, two years before that all happens. So it can be a real slow progress. So knowing that you're taking the Japanese knotweed and it's helping break down the sort of biofilm that's hiding the Borrelia um, at the same time can be um, really helpful. And I had no idea it was used as a mouthwash in Korea. So the Koreans knew, knew about it way back. Next slide, please. Andrographis, again, another herb that's really useful. Um, it stops um, the bacteria communicating. That's one of my favorite um, ways of explaining it. And it stops them communicating and dupli you know, duplicating in, in one sense. Uh, again, it's very protective of the body, reduces inflammation on the central nervous system, reducing pain, head, um, headaches. Again, a lot of people get real pressing brain, um, head pain you know, in the eyes. Um, and again, it stimulates the immune system protective of the heart. It's also the king of bitters. So it's really important, this kind of gut brain connection, stimulating the digestive system and helping um, support the individual's digestive health, as well as supporting the lungs. Next slide, please. Scutellaria, I thought I'd share with you, um, especially this time of year, because it's an antihistamine and I don't know if you're aware, all the elderflowers are out. Again, another great antihistamine in the nettle seeds. Um, Scutellaria balisensis is a fantastic herb. So not only does it help people who are undergoing antibiotic treatment um, support them, it also has antiviral properties. Um, and um, 
so it does both again it's one of the top herbs that i use it inhibits the efflux pumps and it also um, helps with melatonin levels um so it's particularly people who are finding it difficult sleeping it's a really lovely coming herb um, to help with melatonin it's anti-inflammatory as well uh, and commonly used for asthma and allergies, sinusitis, rhinitis, um, hepatitis, so any kind of liver support that's needed. Um, and it helps regulate the sugar levels. It's quite different from the um, Scutellaria latifora, and I talk about that a lot in my book, um, whereas the Scutellaria valsensis is more um, antiviral and microbial. The latifor is much more calming on the nervous system. So when people are on um, painkillers and trying to reduce their um, opioid medication and come off their painkillers, I'd be using more things like the latifor flora um, to support them. Whereas if they were still very active viral or histamine, I'd use uh, the Chinese skull cap, which is this one, or I might use them both together, but they do act very differently. And I think this is one of the problems when people use common names for herbs um, and you get that with cat's claw as well. <clears throat> They're a different species and um, it's important to recognize they, 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 they might have slightly different uh, uses. Thank you. Next slide, please. So I thought I'd mention pomegranate because Daphne is going to be making a wonderful pomegranate and rosemary drink at the book launch on Sunday, um, celebrating Lost in Lime. And um, one of the, the benefits of drinking pomegranate juice, and you know, when you go to Morocco, you can get it at any side stall. Everyone's, you know, growing loads of pomegranates, and pomegranate juice is very reasonable. Um, and drinking it all the time. And here it's more of a delicacy, sort of sprinkled on a salad, but we need more than that. Um, extracts of uh, pomegranate juice can increase liver enzymes, help with the detoxification pathways, and again, support and reduce the bacteria in the mouth and around the teeth and gums, which is really important to look at if, um, if there are any complications with Lyme disease and you feel like you're not improving, looking at your uh, the gums, uh, would be a good place to start. Pomegranate has been reported um, to improve cognitive function for that brain fog as well, reduce inflammation, and to help reduce some of the arthritic symptoms, um, fatigue and exhaustion. So particularly for those kind of fibromyalgia or um, brain fog, sort of chronic fatigue type symptoms, drinking pomegranate juice regularly could be a real benefit. And again, Boona uses it to, as part of his mycoplasma um, and partonella program. Thank you, next slide, please. So this is an area that's sort of in the book that's all about self-help. And there are sections, there are lots of sections talking about pain and how you can help support yourself. Um, but one of the areas that I compare because I can I have lots of these mind maps in the book and the overlapping of some of the symptoms of the co-infection are quite similar to the, the Borrelia burgdorferi whether it's the mycoplasma Bartonella babesia there are kind of overlapping symptoms and similar herbs that you can use um, uh, depending on the individual's needs but one of the things that I rarely in, in, in all my years of research um, haven't seen put together um, as you know like this is looking at the vagal nerve and um, you know it's the 10th cranial nerve at the back of the head it responds to your fight and flight response it's an ethanderthal sort of part of your brain and it's very much out of your control controlling um, involuntary movement and what we see what we hear the tone of voice around us our nervous system picks up and responds we either want to run away or um, we freeze rabbit in the headlights or um, we're in a kind of resting digesting state and I think what with COVID and everything that's going on for people especially when your your health has been so bad for such a long time um, we can we can often be put caught in this parasympathetic state of hyper vigilant and hyper anxious. You know, have I done this? Have I done that? Or, oh, my God, I've got to call the doctor and I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And at some point you're, you just freeze and you don't know which way to turn. 
And it's it's explaining this to a lot of my clients and looking at some of the symptoms of headaches, dizziness, visual disturbances, tinnitus, tickly cough, you know, some of these symptoms, mood disorders, anxiety, blood pressure, tingling numbness, difficult relax, um, regulating their temperature. Whereas the te regulating temperature could be thyroid, but some of these symptoms could also be part of the um, Lyme disease picture. And it's understanding that healing happens when you're in a resting, digesting state. When you're hypervigilant, the cortisol levels goes up, your immune systems goes down, you're more susceptible to infection. And it's understanding how important it is to rest. And, and that's hard when, when um, there's a lot going on, you may have a family, you've got a business to run, um, high, you know, you've, you've got a lot going on. But that time to rest is really, really important. And this is where, again, the herbs come in and really handy because they can, again, you know, especially in the mint family, um, the melissas, the lavenders, the rosemary and sage, whether essential oils or in herbal teas, they are working on the um, ACH receptors in the gut. And the gut's so important because of it's making all the neurotransmitters but um, and sending signals to the brain. But... These herbs can also calm and support you so that you can rest in your, and digest, like the lemon balm being antiviral. They may not be um, killing off the lime, but these herbs are just as important because they're keeping you calm and keeping you relaxed, um, as well as, you know, helping with the circulation. You've got things like ginkgo to help with circulation to the brain. Um, and all of those things combined with the antibacterial or antiviral herbs that are treating the co-infections, they're just as important because they're keeping you in restful um, state of mind so that your body can heal. So poor vagal tone can resemble and mimic some of the symptoms of Lyme disease and, and stress often is a reason why people relapse into Lyme disease. So you may take antibiotics. I see this, you know, um, antibiotics and think you've not the Lyme disease symptoms or the bacterial load might, may decrease, but then some of the symptoms come up again. And it's because, you know, it's looking back at the vagus nerve, looking at your environment, what's going on for you um, and, and getting the support, identifying and getting the support you need. And I think that's the, the big gaslighting when you haven't got a diagnosis it you're not getting the help you need so it's really looking at that um so oxytocin um Stefan Paul just talks a lot, a lot about this and we've heard about sort of the body holds the the score you know pain memory in the body but um Stefan Porges and his wife Sue um did a lot of research on the vagus nerve and I found um Sue did a lot of research on oxytocin and the love hormone and Oxytocin needs iodine to be released from the body. So seaweed, another fantastic herb that can be added to your diet, not only helps reduce inflammation and arthritis, is a phytoestrogen. So if you're menopausal, great herb as well. It's also helps with the oxytocin pathway. And oxytocin is, is thought to have, you know, was originally the, the herb that was used for um, labor to help with labor pains, but they realized that oxytocin is released, also released um, to help with connection. And I think that we really noticed that in COVID, the lack of connection with people um, and being able to see people. And um, the oxytocin helps relief into um, empathy, building trust. Um, and again, oxytocin really helps reduce um, stress and inflammation. So it's just another little thing to sneak in your diet that could be helping on other pathways downstream. Next slide, please. So in Daphne Lambert's section of the book, which is rather good with their nutritional recipes, there's a wonderful section on collagen broth because we, we, you know, a lot of collagen um, is, um, support is needed when we know with people with Lyme disease. So that's to remind me to mention that. And the steps is a kind of like a map that I sometimes send to clients to kind of map out what's going on for them socially, the food they're eating, who they're hanging out with, are they nourishing them, supporting them? Um, are they doing the emotional work? Is there some deeper work they need to do? What kind of physical issues they have? What herbs could help support them um, physically? And then we work together and add these sections into this kind of medicine wheel, I suppose you could call it. 
And looking at that unique part of yourself, what is unique to you? What do you need to heal? Because often you may be a caregiver or thinking about other people. It's it's trying to find out what, you know, what what things that you would like to do. And I'll, I'll, I had a client once who um, desperately was so ill, in so much pain, could hardly, had to move in back with her family. And um, she really wanted to drive around the corner to see her sister, but she was she just couldn't because she was too much in pain. And we said, well, we just start off with carrying the car keys in your pocket. And after about six months and using the herbs and, you know, steadily working on progress and, and ways to move forward and taking the herbs and um, and eating well. And um, within six months, she was driving again. So there are amazing results that people have. You know, some clients have come to me who, you know, were writers and, you know, couldn't could hardly walk out the door. And, you know, within a six or seven months, you know, they're they're doing yoga again and writing books. And these are people who couldn't open a book, couldn't read more than a page without it hurting their eyes. Um, next slide, please. So I spoke to a client recently yesterday because I hadn't heard from him for a while and I heard from another client that he's cured, he's cured. And that's so why I rang him up and um, I, I said, so what's going on and how are you doing? And he was very grateful to hear from me. And um, he said, I find it difficult to really explain the transformation I've experienced. I sought help from over 20 medical professionals, including cardiac professors and endocrinologists who suspected a tumour on my adrenal gland affecting the fight and flight response. I underwent various tests, and he had this for 11 years, by the way. Um, I had um, I underwent various tests, including traveling on a train with gallons of urine for analysis. However, it was when I consulted with a herbalist that everything changed. Since seeing the herbalist, I have been able to discontinue visits to other healthcare professionals. The herbal treatment has been so effective that I no longer require any medical interventions. I'm incredibly grateful for this newfound relief and freedom. Um, that was a lovely thing to hear just before the book launch. And um, but it was also um, a reminder. He'd also came off a lot of medication um, and I you know, supported him do that. but. Um, his blood pressure was fluctuating all over the place and it was the cocktail of medication that he was in that was contributing to a lot of the problems and um he yeah he's got no symptoms and it was it's a lovely story to hear and it was a very very complex client um and um yeah it was it's you know people just hear about the the kind of the negative impact that Lyme has had on people and the 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 sad the sad events and on on various forums that are going on for people and they don't get to hear about some of the good good you know the people recovering from Lyme disease and that's partly why I wrote the book Lost in Lyme is to encourage people to take their own hand look at some herbs and find ways of supporting themselves that can help them through this sort of myriad of symptoms and with support from their GP as well and encouraging them to sort of explore deeper. Next slide please. So um, Daphne and I are running a masterclass in Lyme disease on the 17th of June uh, 10 to 3. If you're interested in that please um, contact me. Um, it will be a really interesting day, lots of recipes and ideas of how to support you with Lyme disease and looking at the co-infections and individual herbs through the book. So you're welcome to that. Next slide, please. And yes, I wanted to say thank you, Gillian, for inviting me um, to this talk. And um, thank you very much. And I hope this goes, you know, the book helps simplify and it, some of the herbs and helps you understand some of the support that you can get if you have got Lyme disease um, and you're looking for other ways forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julia. That was fascinating. It's, it is a beautiful book, really. Um, sorry, it's not showing up well here on the background, but you've shown us the title many times in your presentation. It's just so well structured. Wonderful illustrations. Thank you. Very, very helpful indeed. Thank you. Um, I'll just start with a question that I've been receiving quite a lot recently, which is my little child has just been bitten, Richmond Park or whatever, and um, I don't know whether to start on 
antibiotics immediately, even though he doesn't seem to have any symptoms? Or are, is there a herbal regime that we can use just in case? And then we'll do some testing maybe after four or six weeks. What would you suggest in a situation like that? How old is the child? Sorry. Well, I mean, I, I quite often get this. Children of various different ages, but, um, you know, because they love to run around when it starts getting warmer like this. And there are so many deer, aren't there, around in the parks? Um, and it, as you said yourself, you say in the book that one only sees an erythro migrans rash about 15% of the time. Mm. So they may have been infected and don't know it. I think Is there a particular set of herbs you would recommend to just carry them over that first four or six weeks or so? Yeah, it's the astragalus. That's what I would recommend, a high uh, high strength. And, and I look at doses in the book. Um, it, it depends on the individual and just monitor them closely if they have any signs of fevers or um, any symptoms. I mean, Borrelia has been around for years. So, who, um, you know, hopefully a lot of people are going to build their own immune system and fight the infections. It's just when when parents start investigating and looking at cd57s as a sign a marker for lyme disease that's when it kind of can get a bit um confusing because even if a test comes back negative we it doesn't necessarily mean that they've um got lyme disease or or not but they might have not produced the antibodies to have a positive test and it it's the CD57 in children is often very young because their immune systems are still just growing. So um, I remember talking to a doctor in Germany about this, a pediatric doctor, and um, as I was having clients who were really concerned about their children and um, that anxiety then put onto the child just in case they have Lyme. Um, and she was really clear about that. The CD57 is not a, a good indicator, especially for children. It's in not children, a good indicator in its own anyway, that. but... Yeah. Um, if you're just going to look at that as a as a as a, mm. uh, as yeah, I, I did I did write to um actually Dr. Schwarzbach, who I know you know personally, just a couple of days ago, um to remind myself, and he did say that you can do the Ellie spot, you know, this test of the um T cells, the other arm of the immune system, rather than the antibodies, within four to seven days hmm. of having had the bite. So that was actually advice oh, that's good. somebody recently because it's a nice. And of course, keeping the tick yes. and testing the tick itself is a wonderful thing to do, but not a lot of people think of that. No, really important to keep a like, little vial on you or little plastic bags. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, we've had lots and lots of comments and um, thank yous. Uh, people are very, very grateful. Um, it, the recording will go up uh, within the next few days, so it will be there. Um, there is a question here. What about the side effects of these herbals? Um, there must be some. Is that something you probably cover in the book, don't you? Overdosing or mixing the wrong herbs together? Yeah, I mean, the one of the, the, the I, I, is identify, making sure that you know um, what's going on and the, the precautions and contraindications are in the book. I had one client with surgeon's symptoms and uh, a, a syndrome, and we didn't know that um, that she had, we thought she had Lyme disease, her her, her her daughter was a nutritionist and thought she had Lyme disease and um, Japanese knotweed can make your mouth a little bit dry and that it made the symptoms worse of the surgeon syndrome, syndrome worse so that was one of the side effects but we didn't know she had that so sometimes you yeah it's part of discovering what's what's going on for the individual and I think um that's a really, really good question. I see it, people start experimenting with mushrooms and fermented food a lot. And sometimes if they got people's gut health isn't, uh, you know, up to scratch, it's the mushrooms can be really difficult to handle on the gut. And also things like the fermented foods as well, um, again, can play havoc with gut health and, and make symptoms go worse, especially if there's a histamine intolerance. So none of this um, you should always look at the contraindications and see if that fits your pick. Sometimes people are on anticoagulants and, you know, you have to really monitor the Japanese knotweed when they're taking that because mm -hmm. of the anticoagulant effect of the Japanese knotweed or, or the ginkgo. Right. Thank you. Um, another attendee is asking, do you cite the studies which demonstrate the mechanism of actions for the herbs that you speak about in your book? In other words, are there other references? There are some references. Yes. There are some, but 
you can get a lot of these references on the internet and Stefan Buna, um, a lot of his references are on the internet as well um, uh, and in, in the back of his book. But yeah, I do cite, but I, yeah, but not, not shed loads because it's all on the internet now. Yes, and I think uh, it's lovely that you've got such a great index in the book as well. Um, so I'll go on to the Q and A's now. I've just covered the chat, though I will go back to it. I understand that Lyme can be transmitted by other insects, not just ticks, such as spiders and some flies. What's your opinion on this? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It's highly likely, highly likely. Yeah, um, there I think are they some did studies testing, on it, aren't there? Mm -hmm. I think they did testing on dogs and, I, you know, I, I can't quote where, they, I, I think it was ridiculously high, the number of dogs who had Lyme disease. Mm. Yeah, of course, that's another question for one's intake form, isn't it, is do you have any pets? Because so often the cats or the dogs are coming in with the tiny little nymphs that you can't see and hiding behind the hairline. Mm. Um, another question here, do you have any specific advice for Lyme arthritis, please? My daughter, age 20, had one course of antibiotics for a month and is now being treated with, with biologics for chronic Lyme arthritis. However, she still has daily headaches and chronic fatigue. Well, you know, it's looking at the individual, it's having a, a picture of what is going on for that individual. Um, but using, you know, I I do a lovely combination of um, black cohort, hypagrophytum, bog bean and celery seed. And those four herbs are amazing with inflammation around the joints. But you also need oily fish, you know, reducing inflammatory. And if you look at that chart, of the inflammatory pathways it's sort of coming in from all angles using the turmeric the japanese not weed you know trying to reduce the inflammation but you know food red meat can be a high trigger and, and high sugar processed food is increasing inflammation stress is increasing inflammation hormones can increase inflammations so the reason I ever studied Lyme disease is because I'd never heard of it. One lady called St. John's came to my clinic and whether it was the calling of the woman or because of detective, you know, exploring a condition I'd never heard of. It's it, Lyme disease is everything I've ever studied in one person. You have to know every system and understand how they all connect and incorporate each other. So you could take those herbs to reduce inflammation. But if you're not looking at the wheel, you're not looking at the stresses in your life and looking at how to introduce in, in, reduce the information in other ways, it's not going to completely go away. And the mm. body holds the score. You know, part of the thing with the vagus nerve about how we respond to inflammation, because that's what the vagus does. does. When we're in that hypervigilant and hyperstressed node, we start manifesting health problems, things like fibromyalgia, IBS and those symptoms. Mm. And, you know, if there's a history of antibiotics that can also um, contribute to some of the symptoms of, of, of arthritis. So it's making sure eliminating the top detoxification pathways are clear and, you know, working on so many levels to reduce inflammation, but those four herbs are good and turmeric mm. as well, without doubt with black pepper. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. Another question here, what's the most potent and effective herbal tinctures in glycerin or alcohol? Do you have any opinion on that or does it vary? Well, a really good question. Really good question. I mean, some people, I mean, some people can't, don't want to take alcohol for the religious reasons, feel like they can't take alcohol because of they feel like quite hungover all the time and alcohol could make it worse so we suggest boiling hot water and helping evaporate the alcohol sometimes you need high strength alcohol in the 60s 70s to get the active ingredients out of the herb in tincture form you it's not as if it sometimes it's fine in capsules sometimes it's fine in glycerin and water soluble but sometimes you need high dose alcohol to abstract the active ingredients and it's also the dosing some things are some some of the products online are homeopathic they're they're so diluted it's working on a homeopathic energetic level it's not working on a herbal level in drop form so it's it's really understanding why and how you're taking it and what effect it's going to have Understood. and the quality is really important traceability i speak to to um to companies that that bring products in yes that's another story <laughs> okay 
Well, well, actually, there's an interesting question, or a couple of them, really, about Japanese knotweed, because you covered that quite extensively. Um, if it's illegal to grow, where is it actually sourced by herbalists? And is it legal outside the UK? Um, it's sourced from different countries. Um, and it's... Is it legal outside the UK? I do, it is legal outside the UK. So in Japan, it grows naturally and the pandas munch it up. And um, in other warmer mm. countries, it's um, the um, animals eat it. Um, it's just illegal here because it's, it's so yeah. invasive. And it, you know, it, 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 it's difficult to eradicate and people corner it off. Okay, thank you. And um, Maya asks, is it better to use an older Japanese knotweed plant or a younger one? And which par parts of the plant do you use and how? It's all in the book. Okay. Um, is there an equivalent to the pomegranate juice for those who need to be on a keto diet? Or um, are there effective doses that don't increase carb load excessively? Ooh, I don't know. I mean, what one could do, of course, is take an extract of pomegranate, I suppose, if it were mm. really well sourced and pure. Mm. You didn't want to, you know, load yourself down with the actual juice. Yeah, but, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Don't know. Another attendee asks, what's the average length of the program for someone with chronic Lyme? I appreciate that everyone is different but it helps to know if it's closer to a few months or one year or two years, or does it, does it vary? I'm, I'm adding this now. Does it vary according to the load? And do you like to do testing just to check to see where you are? Well, it's an, it's an 18 month protocol. And so I, sometimes if sometimes people have had, had antibiotics and their protocol might shorten because their symptoms aren't so bad it really depends what stage they're at on their journey some people have had it years and um it can take longer to to go i mean that chap i spoke about oh i think my dog's trying to get in um either the chap i spoke about i think he was on it for the pro program for a year when he, all his symptoms had gone and he was excuse me um sorry um my dog <laughs> He's trying to get in. Um, all his symptoms had gone, whereas I had a client who didn't want any antibiotics and she was, um, the protocol was about four years. But it's, you know, the doses and individual treatments are really very different and unique. Some people can handle really high doses, 10 mil three times a day, where other people will have drop doses. So, mm. it's, so it's the, the, the consultation is so tailored to the individual. It's really difficult to know. And some people are able to finance it. Some people um, drop out for financial reasons or, or just use the herbs and, you know, email twice a year or something so everyone is is quite different depending on what they how complex and how much family history and 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 also because it amplifies underlying conditions that they could have already okay. have so if there's an arthritis in the family it's likely to amplify that the arthritis and inflammation so they have to be extra strict um sometimes it takes people seven months just to get the gluten-free diet to get you know together it's kind of when you're ready to make the steps right. and go forward it will it will depend on where you're ready I mean some people have to hear they have to take fish oils three times before they actually take them right uh, are you okay to go on for another five minutes just because we started a tiny bit late sure it has uh, got a bit later than I expected. Um, so everyone, this is being recorded and it will be made available afterwards if you do have to go. I know the hour's up. Um, have you been able to treat someone with psychosis and Lyme with herbs? Um, I suppose we're getting onto the more sort of uh, pans pandas type of uh, condition where you might have an infection triggered neuropsychiatric condition. Mm. Yeah, I think 
I think this is where the vagus nerve really comes in. It's this high vigilant, high stress, high anxious um, state where that becomes your norm. And coming into a resting, digesting, safe space can be triggering in a different way, can trigger trauma. And that's where the emotional work has to be done. It's kind of a big chunk of, of you know, sometimes people, um, have, you know, you see counsellors, because um, I'm not a counsellor. So sometimes people will see counsellors or therapists alongside me whilst doing the work. So they do they work on that level and we can discuss any of, uh, you know, how the herbs can support them. It, I think um, it can make it complicated because of the medication they're on and the That's interaction correct. with other, other the antibiotics or medication. So things like H, um, St. John's wort or, but there are lots of herbs that you can take even with on that medication. Um, it's just supporting the individual in whatever way they need really. So it, it and, and it depends when they're, when they're, the client patient rapport works or not absolutely um any advice on using hyaluronic acid and herbs for destroying lime spiral sheets when they're in their cystic form um yeah i mean clink Heart's really big on that um i think i would send you to, to direct you to him because um Yes, I see a lot of clients who are taking it and part of a protocol. Often people, I, I usually take the herbs, you know, that's my herbal expertise and uh, functional medicine or nutritionists or doctors will have their own protocol. And we often, you know, work together and um, support each other depending on what they want to do um, and what they, they're drawn to. I remember one, one uh, doctor who I was working with had Japanese knotweed growing on his garden and he was waving at him and he was reluctant to take it and it was part of the protocol and then it was in his neighbor's mm -hmm. garden waving at him again going I've got to start taking it so sometimes you're nudged into certain areas or hyper -barred, um you know oxygen tents and you know there are all sorts of different um practices out there it's which one speaks to you, which one resonates to you um, and the, which one helps you. So um, it can be really effective and some, some clients don't find it effective. So it de really depends on the individual. Absolutely. And then the last question or, or one of the last, because I think more have come in in the chat, but uh, we'll finish with this one is what's the best way of testing for Lyme? And um, shall I just mention a couple of words on that? Because we'd said relating to testing, you'd be happy if I gave an answer is that okay julia yeah, brilliant you thank you um the um t cells that we've already mentioned testing the t cells rather than the antibodies is a very good way really of testing for lyme and co-infections and viruses really because the antibody tests um which are the only tests generally offered in the uk um igg only shows you whether you've had the infection in the past, if it is still active, and it, it may not, IgG doesn't always continue to circulate. Um, if it's very high, of course, there are certain ways of interpreting it, but generally your GP will just say, well, that shows you've had it, not that you still do. And the IgM, that's the immunoglobulin M form of the um, antibody, usually dissipates within a few weeks of catching the infection. So after a few weeks, it's gone. And so you may still have a chronic infection, but be unable to pick it up with the tests that are offered in the UK and in fact, in most countries of the world. So the other arm of the immune system, which um, um, you do describe beautifully in your book as well, Julia, um, the T cell tests, which are called Eli spot tests, um, enzyme linked immunosorbent uh, spots that um, for Lyme certainly um, is more likely to pick up an infection that's still ongoing, even if it's chronic. So um, the other way of picking up the cyst forms that have just been mentioned is what's called um, Tickplex at Armin Labs. And that is um, the only test in the world actually that can pick up the round body form or the cyst forms that um, develop if Lyme has come under attack or Borrelia, I should say, and has dug its way into the tissues. And um, so, that that has a good chance of indicating whether they're still there 
So um, lots more to say on all of this, uh, Julia. So we must have you back again another time to talk more perhaps about the co-infections because we haven't really covered Babesia and Bartonella and Rickettsia and all of those. So it'd be lovely to have you talking about the viruses too. Um, Jill is asking, can you spell the name of that test? Ellie spot is the one that's a bit less uh, well-known, E-L-I-S-P-O-T. AONM, who's actually hosting this, that's the Academy of Nutritional Medicine, um, can give you information on that because it is a test that we run for Armin Labs. Uh, we're the suppliers of that here in this country. So do just contact us. But um, Julia, thank you so, so much for that absolutely amazing talk and all the knowledge that you've imparted to us. Everybody's asking um, for your slides. And I know that you've said that you want to do a little bit of further work on them and perhaps, you know, after your book launch, consider whether um, we'll have access to the slides, but certainly the recording will be up there. And where would where should we buy your book, Julia? Well, I mean, if you there, want it? on Amazon and give a review, I'd be most grateful. Um, it's um, it's available now. It's just come out and the book launch is on Sunday. So I'm very excited about that. And um, it's it's kind of strange writing a book. You kind of feel a bit detached from it. But as um, preparing for the talk, I started looking at it and I was so excited. I've been getting emails and texts from people just saying thank you so much. And I off and it's so I'm so glad to be able to in a two hour session, you can't possibly explain everything about Lyme. And I'm so glad to be able to say it's all in the book. Just have a look um, in the book. People <laughs> um, are saying though that they'd like signed copies of yours. So maybe that's something we can put up on our website as an option. Would that be all right? You can yes. maybe supply us a few signed copies that we can send out to people. Let's work that out. Yes. Thank yeah. you, Alessandra. That's a lovely thought. Well, um, again, thank you very, very much, everybody, for being here. And sorry, it's just been a little bit longer as well today. But um, just to mention that we will have Dr. Sarah Myhill in our next webinar, speaking on the 20th of June. That's a Tuesday. And the title of her talk is Breathe Easy maximizing the benefits of oxygen for better health and wellness. And that's going to be absolutely fascinating. Do have a look at the write-up of her talk on our events um, page on the website, because it's a bit counterintuitive what she's going to be talking to us about. So, Julia, thank you very, very much again and look forward to having you on once more. Thank you again for having me and good luck on your Lyme journey and hope the plants can help you as they've helped many of my clients. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.